بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أوجه تحية للجميع لبدء الجلسة السادسة We'll be talking about an important topic in the light of the crises and changes in the Gulf states. Uh, pol public policy are a guideline for decision making, or uh, there are plans of action. There are many questions. What are the mechanisms for uh, public policy used in the Gulf? Uh, in order uh, to draft strategies and decisions, are there uh, are, are there clear public policies, or there is an absence such of policies which creates challenges in decision making and achieving results and goals? Are there consensus uh, between? Uh, public policy making and the demands uh, of the populations. Uh, do the GC states uh, base their public policy on, on solid grounds? Uh, this is what we'll be discussing in this session, uh, which will include three speakers. We will begin uh, with uh, Eleni Polimenopoulou. Poly she is uh, uh, she is professor of political science in HBKU. Uh, her research uh, uh, centers on human rights, especially cultural rights, uh, and the freedom of expression. Uh, uh, concentrating on the creation of religion and and law, she is a former human rights lawyer for various governmental and non governmental organizations, including the Greek Refugee Council. She, her paper is Enhancing Human Rights Policies in the Gulf. Uh, Ms. Eleni. OK, thank you. Uh, shukran. Sabah um, al-khair. Unfortunately, my Arabic is not that good yet. So I will do my presentation in English. And uh, really happy to be here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting your critical um, input to my presentation and looking forward to um, listening to your questions because I know my uh, topic may sound uh, a little bit paradoxical. It's topic even, it's enhancing human rights policies in the Gulf. And we know very well that this part of the world is not well known for its uh, very good human rights standards. So I guess uh, we can do some critical discussion after the presentation because my point is to say that there have been recently some trends to enhance, in a way, human rights. Um, now, I will start by uh, briefly by ex explaining the concept of human rights as such, the concept of human rights policies, and then I will explain the usual ways that states use to adopt human rights policies. I will go on explaining why it is important to endorse these policies and which are the obstacles for their implementation in the GCC. And um, doing my submission that there is this shift towards um, uh, some sort of human rights reform in the region, I will be drawing primarily from the uh, Qatari example to the extent that I'm uh, fam more familiar with uh, Qatar as I've been in this country for about a year and a half. And then I will provide some examples also of best practices and try to draw some comparisons and suggestions for implementations of human rights in the region. So first of all, okay, what are human rights policies? Obviously, there are policies about um, that promote human rights. Now, human rights themselves have a twofold meaning. Firstly, and in substance, they are about values. Oops. Sure, how to put the next. Sorry. Ah, okay. Oh, 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 which one? Ah, this one. Oh, the left one. Okay. Uh, okay. So, first of all, human rights are about values. They're about if if they are about anything, they are about equality, dignity, and justice. Now, of course, the problem is that people give different meanings to these words, and um, the. 
there has been a lot of debate about their exact meaning and especially their universality. If they can really be universal, if they're only Western values that are inspired from some, I don't know, Eurocentric approach to, to the world and we are just trying to transpose uh, things from the West that don't really apply in this part of the world. Um, there, uh, this is, of course, directly associated with the history of human rights as stemming from the Judeo-Christian tradition and also from um, atrocities that happened during the Second World War. I have here uh, in my slide the preamble of the Universal Declaration of 1948. So this you can read, for example, that um, disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts. We have uh, uh, outraged the conscience of mankind. So all this is directly associated with Nazi uh, atrocities that happened in the center of Europe and not in other uh, um, uh, parts of the world. Um, however, so there is a very strong cultural critique to human rights as such. I don't want to go in depth in this critique, but um, uh, my submissions here is that first the Universal Declaration was um, met with no opposition from no, uh, uh, no countries apart from Saudi Arabia. Um, who had an objection to this. And secondly, we cannot really believe uh, nowadays that people around the world somehow enjoy um, being subject to arbitrary arrests and killings and not having the freedom to speech. Uh, so I think we can make ourselves for now, uh, we can agree for now um, in terms, in substantial terms of human rights as values, and then go on to the most, um, to the second meaning of human rights that is more debated, if you want, that human rights are not really only about values, but they're also um, about legal claims. So they mean, uh, uh, this means that uh, human rights are claims that can be formulated against one state. So you can actually take your own state to court for not respecting your human rights. This is what um, uh, legal, cla uh, legal claim means. Um, so these claims, they may give rise to legal entitlements ranging from the respect of the right to life, the right to physical integrity, uh, the right to um, uh, profess different religions and speak different languages, prohibition of discrimination and so on so forth, so on. So you understand this is where the problem begins. Uh, now, how do states adopt uh, human rights policies? Well, there are, if you want, two ways to adopt them. The first way is the one I'm more familiar with as a lawyer. So it's through uh, law, through international treaties in particular. So states undertake international commitments um, at an international level and then they transform these commitments in their national laws and subsequently also in their national policies. This is the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the first thing. Uh, these human rights treaties are quite interesting from an international law perspective because uh, contrary to uh, other human rights treaties, human rights treaties are not about states' interests as such. It's states that sign these treaties and they agree together that they want to go ahead with a particular topic, for example, the prohibition of torture. But then the ultimate beneficiaries of these treaties are not states, but they're rather individuals themselves. Uh, so as a result, in those countries, say, if a Gulf state uh, signs a treaty and then undertakes obligations under international law, from that treaty, that is, they ratify also the treaty, uh, this means that that Gulf state will need to take appropriate legislation uh, to implement that treaty at a national level. And further on, there will be policies that are, will be adopted uh, precisely uh, from legislation that are stems from the treaty. But this said, most human rights treaties actually impose obligations to make law. They impose obligations to make law and even to make uh, policies. So I give some examples here of legislation, of treaties that have been um, more or less welcome in, uh, in the Gulf. For example, 
uh, these, uh, the two first ones, the third one is a more uh, controversial one. The two first ones are the first, the International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, that is the acronym ICERT, and the second one is the CRPD, that is the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Both these conventions have been accepted uh, with minor, if you want, reservations, apart from uh, Saudi Arabia and the, uh, the first one. Um, and they directly impose legislative obligations. So the first you will read, it says that, for example now, ICERT says, states shall declare an offense on hate speech punishable by law. So this means that they need actually to pass legislation to do this. Or the second one, the CRPD says that states need to adopt all appropriate legislative, administrative, or other measures. So it means they should adopt policies uh, that promote the rights of persons with disabilities. The last one is a very controversial one. It's the CDAO. It's the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination um, Against Women. Uh, Article 2 of the CDAO uh, again uh, imposes to states obligation to change their constitutions, to promote gender equality, to promote laws, but also to adopt policies to eliminate progressively um, uh, uh, discrimination against women. Uh, that is the uh, first way to adopt a human rights policy. The th second way to adopt a human rights policy is through local laws, directly through local laws. And in this way, uh, these policies have more, if you want, cultural and social legitimacy. Uh, so in these cases, uh, States don't adopt, of course, human rights strategies as such, but they adopt policies like now we see in the Gulf with the adoption of visions. Um, we enunciate a number of principles, a number of objectives and strategies. Uh, however, in order to achieve these objectives and strategies, to some extent at least, at least th this is so I, I argue, uh, uh, these states need uh, conform to human rights standards. Of course, there are challenges associated with this, and I will start with the, the uh, first uh, way I told you, it's um, uh, international uh, conventions. So, uh, for example, uh, now perceptions in the Gulf about human rights differ. I don't want to go very far. I know there are extremes, for example, Saudi Arabia is one extreme as per its constitution, even the governance is subject to Sharia law. Ways, uh, the way legislation uh, works there is very different from other parts of the Gulf, say uh, Kuwait or Oman or uh, Qatar. Uh, however, uh, generally speaking, the attitude of Gulf states towards international human rights treaties is generally uh, negative and quite selective. So apart from the CRPD and the ICER, the ICER that I mentioned before, in other treaties, the obligations they are actually undertaking, so this means to create legal claims for their individuals, are not, let's say, to the point of the international human rights uh, standards as they are at present interpreted by bodies, um, uh, international bodies. So this means generally a small number of uh, uh, signature of these treaties, small number of ratification, but also generally speaking a large number of reservations. Reservations means a reservation is a commitment when you sign and ratify a treaty as a state, you say at the same time that I do not wish to be bound by this or that provision of the treaty because it goes against my own system, my belief. For example, in this part of the world, we use a lot Sharia law as a one uh, justification, or even it can be just the state national system. Uh, I have here some examples of reservations to the CEDAW. Uh, uh, so, uh, the uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Oman, they have a blanket reservation, uh, as we call them, that they will not implement any provision, the, the rather Saudi Arabia is like that, as if it conflicts with the perception of Sharia law. Omani reservation is similar. They will not implement anything that goes against uh, the Sharia or the national laws in Oman. So this means basically, okay, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, taking the obligation to commit, but at uh, the same time I'm not committing. And also numerous reservations, the UAE and Bahrain also um, 
and even uh, Kuwait and Qatar have uh, placed significant reservations in particular uh, to general affirmation of the right to, general, uh, to gender equality and also freedom of movement because male guardianship presumably is an issue in the, these countries. So all Gulf countries has, have placed reservations specifically on the matter of freedom of movement of uh, women. So this is, if you want, uh, the traditional, let's say, approach to human rights. And you, we can go on and on and on discussing all Gulf states' reservations and many uh, other reservations of OIC uh, countries uh, generally. Uh, so for example, only a small uh, other example, the UAE has placed a reservation in terms of freedom of expression. All uh, Gulf countries have reservations in as far as freedom of expression is concerned, but even on children books, so that they will not allow children books, that's a reservation to the CRC, the Convention on the Rights uh, of the Child. If you know what is in these uh, children books uh, goes against the country's tradition and values. Okay, now uh, this is not as gloomy as it seems. Uh, this is the traditional attitude of Gulf states. Of course, there have been changes. For example, uh, Qatar, in light of uh, the award, as soon as they got the award for the World Cup, they were faced with significant criticism in all uh, areas, especially those re relevant to uh, labor laws and labor policies, and uh, conditions of workers and the system of uh, sponsorship, etc. They face this criticism from a lot of international bodies, ILO at first, uh, then there were uh, non-governmental entities, Amnesty International, etc. Uh, however, in light of these criticisms, mm, criticisms uh, Qatar made a very good effort to um, uh, uh, to uh, implement reforms in its policies that not only uh, are in line of standards based, uh, standards set by ILO and these organizations, they actually sometimes go beyond uh, these standards. Um, uh, that is one thing. Also, uh, in light of the, uh, not in light, but because of the blockade in 2017, there was increased tension in the region, right? So, um, as you know, Qatar wants to keep its position in global uh, politics, in international relations, uh, and they also, in this context, they um, uh, initiated a lawsuit before the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, against uh, the UAE for discrimination of Qataris themselves at the UAE. So this was the first time that Qataris were the object of discrimination. They were, face they were facing in their everyday lives at school, education, work, they were themselves the object of discrimination. So from then on, I think that Qatar made a smart move there. They thought that, okay, this international human rights system after all, is not that bad as it seems. There are some benefits from, from there. So what, they, uh, what Qatar did uh, to its, um, um, uh, in a, uh, in a, in a very positive, let's say, move, they ratified the uh, two key human rights treaties in 2018, uh, the ICCPR and the ICCR for civil and political rights, the first, and for cultural, economic, and economic, social, and cultural rights, the, the second one. So they ratified these two very important treaties, undertaking obligations at the international level. They are the third Gulf state to do so. The first was Kuwait after its liberation, um, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the second one was Bahrain, and now in 2006, and now it's Qatar. Uh, from that moment, Qatar has started increasingly using international law fora to resolve its disputes. There have been two claims submitted against the UAE and Saudi Arabia before United Nations committees. Uh, claims to eliminate discrimination, and um, there are also other, um, there is also the lawsuit pending, of course, be before the ICJ. Now, um, so what, I, what my point is that um, sometimes uh, states ratify these human rights treaties, but they do it 
for their own benefit. Uh, the, uh, it might not be a benevolent uh, move, but they uh, sooner or later they realize that they have some interests in the ratification of the international treaties. Um, two minutes, okay. So at the same time, uh, sorry, I need to go back. Sorry, what is the button to go back because it's a uh, W. Okay, sorry. Okay, and at the same time, I told you that the second way to adopt human rights policies is from the local perspective. So in this sense, um, do the visions refer to human rights? Well, not really, because the affirmations in the visions, they are pretty lukewarm. They are not very strong. I have some examples of references. For, for instance, the Qatari vision says, refers to personal freedoms, but at the same time to the safeguarding of tradition and values. So in uh, cases where the two clash, obviously there is no commitment undertaken. However, uh, in the strategies that are put in place uh, to... Um, uh, to realize uh, the, the visions, things here are much different. And I take now the example of Qatar. So following the criticism, uh, there have been uh, policy standards and practices for self-regulation in the area of labor rights specifically. Um, secondly, there uh, have been uh, reforms more generally in terms of the system of uh, sponsorship and um, soon, in 2020, there is going to be a new law that abolishes, if I understand well, the system of sponsorship. And that is, I think, um, a very important uh, precedent in the region. And uh, thirdly, there have been also legal reforms, domestic legal reforms, to uh, empower vulnerable persons and groups. So, for example, uh, Qatar passed the first law on asylum in the region, uh, which is also sets a very good precedent. Now, I will conclude. I think uh, that human rights are no longer viewed in the Gulf as instruments of, I don't know, Western imperialism or, you know, something, uh, Western values that we are trying to transpose. But on the contrary, um, they are viewed as tools to achieve the visions, to achieve sustainable economic growth, to achieve these you know, knowledge-based societies and human development that are precisely the objective of the visions. You cannot have human development if you don't respect human rights, if you don't respect the right to education. And you cannot have a vision, uh, you cannot bring tourists, uh, tourists in a country where you don't respect, I don't know, freedom from being tortured or freedom of li liberty and security of the person. So it's just, it needs, I think, to, we need to understand this practical approach to, to human rights. And my very last point is <laughs> only the two challenges, I guess. Uh, the, the first is the area of focus, because until now these domestic reforms have been primarily focusing on labor rights, whereas we need to address other human rights issues. I show you uh, before the array of reservations. Uh, and the second thing is we do also need, perhaps drawing from the Qatari example, to uh, have more countries ratifying human rights instruments because this is where commitment uh, begins. So this is, uh, human rights are also about obligations. I'm not sure if we can create obligations through policies, but I guess the, the future will show. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eleni. Human rights is uh, an important link uh, in achieving the sustainable development goals and uh, and the importance uh, of. Uh, but also, Eleni, I have you agree with me that uh, human rights are not only related to the current generation, but also the preservation of the future generation. 
Thank you very much, Eleni. And well, now we will move to our next uh, speaker and paper uh, m with Mrs. Khawla Murtadawi, the role of public opinion polls in policy making in the GCC. Uh, Qatar as a, mod a model. Khawla is a PhD student in Islamic civilization at the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities in Malaysia Technical University. Uh, she has an MA in Comparative Religion from the College of Islamic Studies at HBKU. Uh, in uh, 2018, she is active in the Qatari media and has worked for the newspapers of Al-Shark and Al-Watan and for Al-Rayyan TV. Uh, in conjunction with other activists, she founded the Arab Social Media Council and the Al-Watan Center for Media Training. She has participated in numerous conferences at HBKU and Qatar University. You have 15 to 20 minutes. Haula, please. The floor is yours. Good day. <coughs> we will be speaking about the role of public opinion polls, and I will focus on the Qatar University and its role. Opinion polls are one of the most important tools used by uh, planners, strategists, and decision makers to uh, learn about uh, general directions regarding a certain topic and uh, use those inputs in uh, making policies. Uh, opinion polls are one of the inputs in public policies, however, they are problematic and they cause debate among scholars, researchers, especially when it comes to uh, scientific uh, research. Uh, this relation should be uh, should be uh, integrational and not only uh, f uh, formal. Uh, it shouldn't uh, be influenced by uh, public uh, opinion. Over the recent years, uh, we have seen interest in studies uh, that uh, tackle public policy making in uh, civil society uh, institutions or organizations. And uh, those uh, studies uh, gained attraction in uh, the uh, governments and uh, states uh, as they tackled uh, social uh, issues. And this uh, led to an increasing role by uh, the civil society organizations uh, as uh, the ones answerable to the uh, needs and requests of uh, citizens. This uh, role um, entrusted with the uh, CSOs uh, was uh, coupled with uh, the emergence of uh, specialized institutions to uh, uh, to uh, probe into the opinions of the uh, citizens and uh, transform them into uh, policies. Uh, the uh, policy makers were interested in uh, knowing what are the opinion of the citizens and therefore those uh, companies or those opinion polling institutions became uh, a renewable source of uh, data and accurate statistics nationwide because they uh, provide governments with accurate statistics that reflect uh, public uh, opinion in uh, several uh, topics that are of interest to both policy makers, decision makers, and uh, citizens, and because they reflect uh, changes in the uh, social, cultural, economic, and political arenas. Therefore, the relationship between public opinion and public policy is uh, uh, goes both ways. Uh, this relationship uh, embodies what uh, the uh, public thinks of and what uh, the uh, government does about it, and therefore. Uh, public opinion, opinion is deemed to influence uh, public policies. Uh, how? Uh, first, because the opinion uh, public, uh, the public opinion can influence what policies are uh, drafted. And second, policy makers will refrain from uh, drafting any uh, policy or taking any stance that will that could be widely uh, countered by the uh, public. Also, uh, such opinion uh, polls could be used to lobby before uh, the uh, government uh, through seminars and other uh, forums. Uh, uh, such uh, forums uh, can uh, make advocacy 
and uh, lobbying to influence public opinion and to draw the attention of a government to a specific uh, uh, issue and this is uh, how governments may be persuaded to adopt or refrain from adopting a certain public policy the relationship between uh, the uh, public opinion and the public policy uh, is at the heart of the debate that started uh, mid last century especially a debate regarding uh, the responsiveness of uh, governments to the citizens uh, preferences knowing that the uh, political regime should combine between uh, inputs, meaning demands, and the outputs, meaning decisions. And therefore, a political regime should uh, combine uh, between uh, uh, demands and decisions between action and uh, needs. Uh, over the last century, the Qatar state has witnessed pragmatic shifts, uh, namely uh, increasing uh, requirements uh, amid the uh, increasing uh, human development uh, demands. And there were achievements in terms of drafting diverse public policies, and those policies uh, received positive feedback. The a public policies drafted by Qatar uh, focused on uh, social welfare, economic development, and security, political uh, sec uh, political stability and security in the uh, country. Here, policy makers disagree uh, depending on the institution they uh, come from. One of uh, the most important uh, player in this effect is the uh, public institutions uh, gathering the legislators, uh, the executive branch, the uh, administrative institution, and the judiciary. Uh, other uh, players uh, include informal actors such as the uh, citizens, uh, political parties, uh, associations, uh, conventional and the new uh, media, and uh, opinion polls. And therefore, opinion poll polling uh, companies or organizations uh, are considered to be uh, players who are effective in uh, policy makers uh, because uh, in policy making because they can influence uh, policy makers by uh, lobbying and therefore they can uh, they can make a certain issue be listed on the national agenda. They can affect and shape decisions from uh, uh, the very early stage of decision making and until the decision is finally implemented and uh, over. Uh, seen. There are several uh, opinion poll uh, organi uh, opinion poll types, uh, opinion polls that are uh, conducted by uh, Qatari institutions and they are supervised by governmental uh, bodies. Uh, and uh, here, uh, the, min uh, the Ministry of um, Health, for example, uh, proposes the uh, uh, proposes conducting opinion polls in the healthcare sector, using uh, to see what uh, equipment, what healthcare equipment, and uh, health uh, practitioners are needed in the sector. And uh, here, uh, ministries, universities, research centers uh, in are engaged, and they uh, take part in. Uh, drafting public policies each in their own uh, sector and domain. Uh, they are uh, shouldered with uh, experts and analysts who specialize in an analyzing the findings of such opinion uh, polls to feed into uh, the uh, efforts of uh, strategists. Uh, the uh, Qatar state uh, witnesses uh, fast economic development and therefore some private sector and public sector institutions are uh, resorting to scientific research and um, and because scientific research are the best to read the needs in the uh, market and oh, an example is uh, uh, companies uh, pertaining to media and uh, public relations. Opinion polls uh, conducted by uh, ministries, uh, Qatari ministries, 
like uh, the uh, Economic and Social Survey Institute at the Qatar uh, University and the uh, Arab uh, uh, Institute uh, for uh, uh, for uh, policy studies uh, are uh, two uh, bodies that uh, provide uh, such opinion uh, polls and uh, they uh, provide also statistics uh, to take uh, representative uh, samples and uh, reflect uh, opinion, uh, public opinion in uh, social, economic, and cultural uh, issues to later influence political uh, participation. Uh, there are also uh, other institutions and organizations uh, such as uh, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Higher Education, the Ministry of uh, Environment and, Rural, uh, and Municipal Affairs, the Ministry of Transportation. All those uh, bodies, uh, they conduct their own uh, opinion uh, polls in uh, their uh, relative uh, or relevant uh, sector. And based on these opinion polls, they draft a uh, policies uh, that will be later implemented. Uh, the Social and uh, Economic Research Center in the Qatar University is considered to be a, a multidisciplinary research center that contributes to the development and the growth of society by providing high quality data extracted from surveys uh, to influence uh, policy making, identify priorities, uh, and uh, conduct researchers in social and economic uh, sectors. The uh, institute conducts um, conduct uh, surveys uh, and uh, publishes reports regarding uh, uh, issues of, uh, uh, of uh, public interest as health care. And it provides also training tools to uh, build capabilities uh, in conducting uh, surveys among studies and academics, uh, including a project uh, researchers. It also supports uh, a, a team of uh, students uh, to uh, gather information. The uh, policies unit inside the institute complements the work of the institute by uh, gathering information and analyzing them through a different perspective by uh, scientific, through scientific methodology and uh, in context uh, knowledge. And uh, their uh, work is uh, based on uh, studies. And uh, this uh, policies unit inside uh, the uh, Social and Economic Studies uh, Institute at Qatar University presents uh, perspectives based on uh, surveys to be used by uh, decision makers and government officials, uh, also policy makers, uh, journalists, and the uh, public uh, and the international community at large. The uh, Social and Economic uh, Studies uh, uh, institute in Qatar University uh, improved in terms of its own performance. It doesn't only present uh, research papers, but they uh, transform these uh, papers into public policies. Uh, oh, these uh, policies included uh, uh, topics about uh, Qatar, such as Qatar Vision 2020, the liberalization of the market, and other miscellaneous uh, issues uh, to uh, move forward with uh, several uh, aspects of uh, Qatar economy and society. And they tackled, for example, uh, Qatar readiness uh, to uh, implement uh, TV, uh, v AT tax in Qatar and also raising awareness or probing into uh, how the people or to which extent the people is aware of the consequences of this tax. Another opinion poll uh, tackled um, to which extent Qatar needs to have a welfare uh, index to see how expatriates uh, foreign workers in uh, Qatar uh, are uh, doing in uh, the work environment and uh, what uh, to which extent they are uh, enjoying welfare. Also, another opinion uh, poll gauges the awareness 
of uh, people, of the oil prices, also job security, living conditions, and uh, uh, larger economic forecasts. Uh, opinion uh, polls and surveys provided by the Economic and Social uh, Service Institute at Qatar University bridge the uh, gap in uh, knowledge as they monitor several uh, social phenomena and they monitor also changes in terms of uh, uh, social and economic changes within uh, the society and they provide accurate information to uh, decision makers. One part of uh, the uh, information that the Institute provides uh, will be re leveraged effectively by uh, policy makers to see whether or not uh, draft a specific uh, policy. Your time is up. Um, so uh, the Institute seeks uh, to support uh, public policy uh, making by providing facts, identifying needs and identifying national research priorities, also uh, providing uh, partners and uh, uh, decision makers with information to, uh, to uh, draft uh, legislations and uh, make people aware of uh, challenges at stake. Thank you uh, for clarifying the relationship between opinion polls and public policy making. This uh, relationship has always been problematic, but today we all agree that this relationship is important, especially amidst all uh, the uh, um, digital transformation and social media revolution. Um, social media is dictating how uh, the youth are uh, uh, reacting to the information they uh, uh, they receive and therefore uh, opinion polls uh, are a necessity to uh, orient uh, them in this uh, regard. Uh, thank you for your uh, paper. We'll move to paper three with Mr. Nabil Hussain. He is a Palestinian researcher who works in the editorial uh, section in uh, Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. He holds a Master of Development uh, Economics specializing in international cooperation from the Doha Institute of Graduate Studies. His research interests focus on uh, political economy and specifically on, uh, on democracy as well as systems of governance uh, institutions and their development and their impact on the economy. His paper is entitled Evaluating the Impact of Government Public Policies on Creating an Efficient and Committed Workforce in Accordance with the Qatar Vision 2030. The floor is, is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, Person. Uh, so with this paper, we conclude session three. So we'll begin with the opening uh, introduction, uh, with the opening uh, paper by Mr. Abdel Nasser Bin Khalifa, Khalifa with the role of QDB in achieving the policies uh, of uh, based on Qatar uh, National Vision 2030. In this paper, we'll speak about uh, QNV as a comprehensive framework of analysis. Uh, this paper entitled Evaluating the Impact of Government Public Policies on Creating an Efficient and Committed Workforce in Accordance with the Qatar Vision 2030. We will concentrate uh, on one pillar of the full fillers uh, of the QNV, which is the economic development, also by concentrating uh, on only one headline or one aspect of the economic development, which is uh, creating an efficient and committed workforce, as mentioned in QNV 2030, especially in the private sector, mainly uh, entrepreneurs. We will start uh, by defining the economic development, as mentioned in QNV 2030. The, uh, QNV uh, de defined economic development as developing a diversified and competitive uh, economy that is able to cater the needs of uh, Qatar, uh, citizens of Qatar uh, in the present and the future and providing a high level of uh, uh, living. What is meant by this definition is uh, to reach one main result, which is economic diversi diversification. The economic diversification means increasing uh, the in increasing uh, the uh, increasing um, 
the role of other non-hydrocarbon sectors in uh, the GDP. The competitiveness is only in this sector because uh, Arab or Gulf states, their economies are based uh, on uh, the production and export of one commodity, which is oil and gas. With uh, regards uh, to the development of non-hydrocarbon non sector, the vision states that uh, investing the revenue rev revenues of the hydrocarbon sector will be invested in the other sectors, the non-hydrocarbon sectors, uh, in order to achieve uh, the goal by saying uh, that the uh, the, uh, the uh, abundant uh, hydrocarbon uh, uh, wealth of Qatar uh, can be used in order uh, uh, to achieve the following by investing in, infra in high quality and world infrastructure and building effective mechanism to provide the public services uh, and providing uh, efficient and committed workforce uh, and uh, supporting entrepreneurship and innovation. The last point uh, is what we will uh, concentrate on in this paper with regard uh, to the final point, uh, the QNV, the QNV states uh, that supporting entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs is a condition in order to allow the private sector to play its role, which is uh, establishing economic diversification uh, through financial and non-financial support instruments uh, that will support SMEs. The conclusion uh, that. Uh, uh, economic development uh, is uh, summed up uh, in providing uh, uh, appropriate infrastructure in order to provide uh, a, uh, 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 an, uh, an environment uh, that supports SMEs and entrepreneurship uh, that will lead to economic diversification. To study this goal, uh, this goal is on the right path, uh, and uh, we have evaluated the impact of uh, public policies in increasing the level of uh, entrepreneurship in Qatar. Uh, let me first talk about uh, the international entrepreneurship uh, monitor. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Abdel Nasser, Abdel Aziz bin Nasser Al Khalifa, talked about this monitor and said that the state of Qatar. Uh, ranks high in this monitor. The International Entrepreneurship, uh, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, uh, GME, was established in, uh, 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 in, two th in, in, two th uh, in 1999. It uh, assesses 20 countries by reviewing uh, entrepreneurship literature. Uh, the monitor uh, show, uh, states uh, that entrepreneurship is uh, dri driven by two main factors, the uh, public space. Uh, uh, on the level of uh, macro economy and on the level of the individual, these are, of course, uh, the attributes of uh, the innovator and the entrepreneur. With regards uh, to the first uh, uh, item, there are uh, 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 there there are uh, uh, there are conditions or requirements. Uh, there are twelve conditions uh, to support uh, entrepreneurs, current entrepreneurs, or uh, to build uh, future entrepreneurs. The second part is about the behaviors and characteristics of uh, entrepreneurs uh, via questionnaires and surveys undertaken by uh, the monitor with entrepreneurs. Uh, we always look uh, at these twelve uh, entrepreneurship requirements. These are the policies uh, that we will assess and evaluate uh, their impact in order to increase the level of entrepreneurs in the state of Qatar. But before that, let us give a panoramic, uh, or let us uh, have a panoramic view of all the economies. From 2008 to 2018, 107 countries approximately, in order to see the changes in uh, uh, that led to the increase of entrepreneurship. These 12 conditions uh, the uh, 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 is the main condition. One is financing entrepreneurs, which is providing financial, re financial resources uh, for SMEs. Uh, so, uh, government support and uh, public policies uh, supporting these policies, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, the, sec the third condition are uh, taxes and bureaucracy. Uh, the uh, are taxes and bureaucracies hindering uh, entrepreneurship in the country or the state or uh, promoting them, uh, primary education, uh, training, uh, and, uh, and uh, how much uh, uh, Including uh, including SMEs uh, in the curricula, and uh, of course promoting vocational training, uh, uh, educational grants uh, and research, educational grants and research. Uh, to what extent uh, do they provide opportunities for SMEs? 
The seventh condition, uh, the uh, commercial uh, infrastructure, uh, intellectual property, uh, accountability, and other services and legal institutions, uh, the physical and services infrastructure, uh, uh, access uh, to physical uh, services, uh, transport, uh, land, uh, spaces, uh, cultural uh, criteria, social criteria. To what extent uh, do they encourage? Uh, do they allow uh, the culture? Do they do these cultural and social uh, uh, criteria? criteria uh, promote entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs in the state. The last uh, two uh, conditions is the openness and dy uh, dynamics of the internal market, uh, uh, the level of change in the market from year to year, uh, year on year, and the openness of internal markets. Uh, to what extent uh, the new companies uh, can access uh, the current markets uh, in order uh, to draw a complete panoramic vision on all uh, the economics of the sample we took or we divided these economies into three economies uh, based uh, on uh, the classification of the monitor, which are uh, the fact uh, 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 medium income, low income, and high income economies, uh, uh, factor driven economies. Uh, uh, economies, uh, these are uh, mentioned by the GEM, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, uh, that includes agriculture, uh, extraction industries, uh, and uh, its dependence on natural resources and non skilled uh, labor. Uh, medium income uh, economies medium income economies uh, the uh, uh, the monitor uh, defined it as efficiency driven economies these are economies uh, that are highly competitive uh, with uh, more efficient uh, products uh, and uh, production uh, industries uh, uh, high income economies are innovation driven economies uh, as per the monitor, these are the most developed, uh, whereby uh, uh, our companies are more knowledge-based and the service sector is, uh, is very widespread. In order to distinguish or actually to only to study the uh, impact of these conditions uh, on the promotion of entrepreneurship, uh, we took uh, uh, the uh, variable, the HDI, which is the Human Development in Index, in order to uh, put aside or neutralize the differences in these countries. The main variable in our model is uh, the TR uh, to, uh, total uh, early stage entrepreneurial activity. Uh, this variable measures the percentage of adult uh, of adult uh, population uh, from 18 to 24 who are uh, who, who started uh, w uh, enterprises uh, or companies uh, less than three years uh, less than three years old. These 12 conditions in the monitor are being assessed and evaluated by national experts in every state with regards to Qatar. There are uh, these conditions were evaluated in, in four years, 2014, 2016, 2017, 2018. In 2014, Silatec has uh, undertaken uh, this national expert survey. And in the coming, in the other three years, uh, QDB has prepared uh, this survey. Now we will look uh, at descriptive statistics for the entrepreneurship activity in the, the state of Qatar. The, the TRET, if we look at this uh, diagram, we see uh, on the left in low average uh, economies, factor-driven economies, uh, the average of entrepreneurship in these countries in economies is approximately 20 percent. In medium average, I medium of impact efficiency-driven economies is 13 percent. With regards uh, to high-income uh, economies uh, or innovation-driven economies, uh, uh, approximately 8 percent. Uh, with regards uh, to uh, the the 12 conditions that were measured in the sample in the countries in the sample these is this is the average of for every condition the highest evaluation was for the physical infrastructure for all economies especially in the high income economies now we will analyze 
our sample. The sample is made is the panel data. It is made up of 107 countries. Of uh, ma It includes many variables over many years in order to study the impact of variables uh, on uh, on uh, the subordinate variables, which is entrepreneurship. There are two, one model of two, either the fixed effect model. I will not uh, delve into it, uh, or the random uh, effect model uh, through the Hausmann uh, uh, experiment, uh, we can identify the more, most appropriate uh, model for our sample, uh, the analysis result, if it is clear for everybody. In the first model, uh, it is low income economies or uh, factor driven economies. With regards to 12 conditions, we there was no condition or policy that had positive impact in increasing uh, the average of entrepreneurship in low-income economies. Uh, the reason is very clear. Uh, these economies are uh, unorganized economies uh, or invisible economies. Uh, the market dynamics are very high in these uh, economies, and the state uh, does not interfere, uh, or uh, there is low interference of the state, uh, or efficiency-driven economies, medium-income economy, economies. In the past 10 years, uh, there was more openness for the internal market, and this has positive impact in increasing entrepreneurship in this state. It was uh, significant over 1%, while economies that are uh, high, uh, high income economies, uh, innovative driven economies in Qatar, like other uh, and other Gulf economies, uh, are high income economies or uh, innovation driven economy, economies. There were three conditions uh, that uh, positively impacted the increase of entrepreneurship during the past 10 years in these economy, economies. First, it is the financing or funding entrepreneurship. Second is the state uh, uh, support and the cultural and social criteria. Third, uh, from this uh, model, uh, we see that the main condition that has a positive impact in increasing entrepreneurship uh, were the cultural and social criteria. And when looking at uh, the uh, uh, the coefficient of uh, correlation, it was 1.6. One one what does it mean? It means uh, that when this correlation uh, coefficient increases, uh, the entrepreneurship uh, uh, average incre increases, of course. During the past five, uh, four years, uh, we implement this model in Qatar. It is a short period, of course, uh, to study what are the conditions that have uh, contributed in increasing entrepreneurship in the state of Qatar. We found in uh, the analysis uh, that there is no condition among these conditions or policies that have contributed in increasing entrepreneurship in Qatar. First, in 2014, there the uh, entrepreneurship decreased in its early stages in 2014 from 16% uh, to 8% in uh, to uh, or 7.85% in 2016 because of uh, the oil price crisis this shows the correlation between uh, the hydrocarbon sector and the non hydrocarbon sector uh, hydro non hydrocarbon sector as we've mentioned in the beginning the revenues of the hydrocarbon sector were invested in developing and empower empowering the non-hydrocarbon uh, sector. In 2017, uh, the entrepreneurship average uh, uh, decreased to 7.4 and then increased in 2018. 18 and we will uh, we will show why uh, there's there's also the internal market dynamics uh, because uh, of uh, the uncertainty the the internal market dynamics uh, decreased uh, by from 3.15 uh, to uh, and it, it decreased in 2018 and 2019 lastly the social and cultural criteria in 2014 it was 2.89 it increased to 3.93 and then it decreased in 2017 to increase in 2018 again now we know why these uh, conditions or the evaluation decreased after 2014 because uh, of uh, the oil price crisis. In 2018, uh, the entrepreneurship uh, activities increased, as we see in the first line, from 7.4 to 8.5, i.e. more than 1.1 percent, uh, an increase in 1.1 percent. This was a result uh, of the blockade of Qatar. and. Uh, 
the national economies in Qatar now uh, are working in order uh, to uh, um, uh, to replace the economies uh, that went out of Qatar after the blockade. So now many countries moved from SMEs uh, to major companies and or uh, rather holding companies. Some companies even uh, were listed on the stock market. Uh, one more minute. Now we will go to the causes, move to the causes or reasons why why didn't uh, the entrepreneurship or efc's uh, really uh, affect uh, the entrepreneurship average in qatar it was first uh, because of the oil crisis and then uh, the blockade of qatar later on uh, the uh, the gradual improvement uh, in these conditions uh, or these policies stopped deterioration in uh, the rate of entrepreneurship uh, and uh, allowed a fixed rate uh, for entrepreneurship in uh, one minute, one more minute. Now we look uh, at the cultural and social criteria. It is the most important policy. This increases entrepreneurship in economies or uh, high income economies such as Qatar, but in Qatar also these criteria have been subject uh, or have been devaluated. Uh, if we look at uh, the fear of entrepreneurs from failure, uh, it increased uh, from uh, one fifth of uh, the entrepreneurs in 2014 said they feared failure. But uh, after the oil crisis in 2015, uh, it decreased, uh, it increased to 35. And then in 2018, it decreased again yesterday. Mr. Abdul Aziz bin Nasr Al Khalifa talk, said that the state of Qatar is the first worldwide in the in the entrepreneurship uh, national entrepreneurship content index NECI in 2018 by assessing the 12 conditions uh, Qatar is, is ranking first worldwide uh, uh, by having 6.5 out of 10 out of this uh, this indicator or this index shows that the state of Qatar uh, has uh, uh, has a prior, uh, 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 ranked first in uh, uh, in on, in many indicators the uh, grants uh, schools education uh, uh, infrastructure also is lagging behind because of the construction going on the cultural uh, criteria ranked high Can you end in a sentence, please? I will end by saying that the rates of entrepreneurship in Qatar are linked by having a new uh, social capital, i.e. moving from investing in, uh, in, uh, in buildings to investing in humans. Yesterday, Dr. Khater talked about that because of uh, the lack of time. I will not delve into this issue. The last point uh, is uh, the if we do not uh, produce a new human capital that is able to empower the private sector, the state will own the private sector. It will remain a rentier state. It will own the non-hydrocarbon sector. It will own the GDP and the state this will lead to a new form of rentier state. Thank you. We open the floor now for Q&A's. We will listen uh, to uh, some of your Assalamu uh, alaikum. I am Hilal Al-Salmi bin Oman. My question goes to uh, Madame Eleni. Uh, I mean, there is human rights. There is a big challenge. I mean, uh, with respect to the Islamic and uh, uh, I mean, uh, national values and traditions with, within GCC countries. But I mean, later on, I mean, when it comes to the SDGs, I mean, Sustainable Development <laughs> Goals, one of them, I mean, respect to this, I mean, uh, international, I mean, human rights, I mean, with this. Later on, I mean, <laughs> again, I mean, this is a dynamic things, I mean, between it is global values, I mean, with respect to the national values or the Islamic values. 
So, I mean, for indices later on, with the once once the country has been evaluated, I mean, on on that 17 goals, which is promulgated by the UN Assembly. I mean, how 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 this any any country? Uh, I mean, within GCC, would would be underestimated. I mean, although there is a respect to the human rights. I mean, from that uh, three uh, pillars: national values, uh, Islamic, and rest. what do you say on su on such things? Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, two <coughs> questions, one for Eleni uh, here, and one for Haula. Uh, for Eleni, uh, last year we heard, I mean, uh, very enthu enthusiastically we heard that Qatar was drafting a law for uh, the refugees. Uh, since any of the GCC is signatory of the convention, we were very optimistic about, uh, about that, because also the, the scope was very big as it was announced. But so far, we didn't hear anything new about that. And I wonder if you had more uh, information about that, if it's finally uh, drafted or passed or no. Uh, the other question is for Haula. Uh, thanks for, for the, the, the picture you show us about the, the role of public opinion. But I wonder if you think that is something else that the government can do in order to get more uh, public opinion to uh, push for some policies. Uh, uh, for instance, we know that Twitter is a very important tool to express opinion and that the government is very aware of what the Qatari population think about certain topics. I wonder if this could be one element, formal or informal, to collect uh, information. I'm related to that, my question is whether this Twitter expressions are sometimes more powerful in terms of lobbying for some ideas than public opinion polls conducted by institutions like CESRI or other institutions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, hello, my question goes to Mrs. Uh, Khawla. In your opinion, how uh, could we <coughs> improve the quality of uh, public uh, opinion uh, polls? So that uh, the uh, topics respond to uh, the actual uh, needs and the findings are uh, accurate. Uh, I am uh, aware of uh, certain uh, research aspects in uh, Qatar. Uh, today we are uh, witnessing a wider use of uh, technology, especially University of Hamad bin Khalifa, where uh, digital humanities is teached. And uh, uh, so uh, digital humanities uh, um, relies on uh, opinion polls and modern studies. Also, uh, humanities uh, research, uh, whatever that is uh, available uh, in the cyberspace, how can we uh, develop ourselves and evolve in order to extract the quality and the uh, benefits that such uh, opinion polls uh, have to offer? Your approach here is uh, almost exclusively legislative approach. Uh, and as you know that uh, laws, regulations, conventions are basically, they, they play the role of deterrence from violation of human rights and everything else. Though, uh, don't you think that we need to implant the culture of respecting human rights? That is, we move from uh, abiding by the law to uh, respecting the law in a voluntary manner. Wouldn't you think that uh, laws and regulations, the legislative approach is not good enough, but the implantation of the respect and observation of human rights is what we need and we go into the social dimension in this manner? Thank you. Uh, 
Nasser Asadi. My question goes to Mr. Nabi. Thank you for your uh, presentation about uh, entrepreneurship uh, criteria and index. Um, you showed us three models at the end of your presentation, and I uh, had a feeling that these are uh, psychological uh, conditions and not uh, uh, practical uh, indexes. I uh, believe that uh, uh, it is important to uh, change uh, people's views towards uh, some uh, professions and occupations, for example. For um, women cannot work in just any occupation. Don't you think that this uh, uh, influence uh, the entrepreneurship uh, context and uh, work? My question is to Mrs. Khawla now. Of course, uh, opinion uh, polls uh, contribute to improving the uh, policy making process in general, but uh, in uh, the states uh, in uh, general, the Arab states uh, and the GCC states uh, in general, and not only in Qatar, uh, such uh, opinion polls can uh, be uh, used in uh, uh, service sectors, uh, education sectors, and healthcare sectors. Uh, and they, but they are not used in politics. Uh, if we uh, go if uh, the findings of a certain opinion poll shows uh, that uh, the youth or uh, women would like to take part in political life, uh, will those uh, findings be used and be taken into account? In Palestine, uh, we have uh, the um, Arab uh, Institute for Policy Studies that is presenting now uh, opinion uh, polls uh, as uh, to uh, the people's stands uh, towards uh, Palestine. Do you take such findings into consideration and in your uh, political approach uh, to uh, the uh, question of uh, Palestine? My question goes to Mrs. Uh, Khawla. Uh, in opinion, uh, Paul, uh, what are the tools used? And uh, what are the challenges that uh, you face? And how is, to which extent is the public acceptive of uh, such uh, polls? Also, uh, are the findings binding to the uh, government uh, or uh, not uh, when uh, drafting or, or uh, making policies? I would have liked to see a practical uh, example or any decision. Uh, that was uh, taken by the government uh, based on uh, the uh, outcome of a certain public uh, opinion uh, poll. Uh, Mr. Nabil, in uh, the uh, Vision uh, 2030, uh, yes, there was a focus on entrepreneurship, and the Vision did create a competent uh, workforce, uh, but uh, how did it affect uh, entrepreneurship in uh, general? I will uh, uh, hand you over now to the speakers. Uh, Mrs. Elena. Okay. okay, thank you for your questions. I, I'll start with a less complex one, which is... Uh, uh, the the um, the recent loan asylum. So there has been such law that was uh, passed last year, uh, late last year, if I'm not mistaken, October or so. Now the issue, of course, is here that the Gulf countries have not signed or ratified the Geneva Convention, and this is where obligations stem from. And the additional problem is that the law that was passed is not exactly in line with the refugee standards. So the Refugee Convention tells you that there are five very specific grounds on which, not very specific, but five grounds on which you can um, uh, request asylum. So there needs to be persecution, and the persecution needs to be based on these precise grounds. One of them is political opinion, but there is also ethnicity, religion, there are other grounds, and there is also a ground that says or any other status. That is the most controversial ground because any other status can really, so it says so membership in a uh, social group or any other status. And this any other status can be interpreted in many ways and it has been interpreted by in many ways in countries such as uh, Canada, for example, or uh, 
um, the, the UK, this any other status has uh, been interpreted to include discrimination on uh, a lot of grounds that I don't think that in this part of the world would we'd have an equivalent. Uh, uh, it is my understanding that the recent Qatari law covers only political refugees. And I don't know, to be honest, how many these political refugees are. Now, this is a controversy also at a global level, who exactly is the refugee. Uh, but at least there is some precedent, I, I, I think. There is some good precedent in the region. Now for the S SDGs uh, question, that's a very good question, actually. And it is true that all Gulf countries have embraced the SDGs, and they are really going well in this. They are organizing events and conference, uh, conferences. And uh, here in Doha, there have been so many events. I was so surprised to see this, because I only arrived a year and a half ago, and you know I didn't expect this engagement where, with the right to education and uh, uh, the right to development. But I think that, generally speaking, uh, the debate on social and economic rights in this part of the world is way ahead, uh, you know, other countries. And this is probably also because social and economic rights are partially related also to a country's infrastructure and ability to uh, you know, to, to, to uh, ability of resources. So this is also one of the reasons. Um, uh, however, now with the SDGs, there has been even critique within human rights. To, to, the problem here is to which extent do you actually undertake some legal obligation? Legal obligations are very specific. For example, you have the European Court of Human Rights. It interprets the European Convention of Human Rights. And if a state violates that convention, they need to pay money. They need to pay money to the person they're violating their rights. So there is a very specific mechanism, or they undertake international responsibility at the ICJ. So it is one thing to say that there is a policy that one day, uh, now I don't know because I'm speaking as a lawyer and uh, this is my primary standpoint, but it is one thing to have a policy uh, and another thing to, to, to have a law where you get also some responsibility and if you break that law then there are some sort of consequences. Um, however, I'm very interested in taking this debate f further and I need to read more about this because I'm under the impression that in this part of the world policies are almost, if not more important than laws. And this brings me to the third uh, question on the culture of uh, human rights. And um, now I, of course, it is very, uh, I mean, being Greek, I'm the f I would be the first one to say how uh, it is important to do things because, you know, we, we, uh, there is some inherent belief that what we are doing is good. This was the whole idea of Pericles under the Athenian democracy. You know, that, that the Athenians are doing so great because they are doing what is good because they really think it's good and not because of some external force such as the law. Of, so, in short, I think both are, um, uh, both are, of course, important, but sometimes adopting a law, uh, even ahead of, if you want, uh, social understanding, is also very important. So, for example, in 1952, where women were accorded internationally the right to vote, I don't think that society was ready for such law because, in many cases, families were not ready, and you know, it's the patriarchal structure of societies that I mean, in my home country, is very similar to. To this. But I think that if you actually adopt a law, even a little bit ahead of society, this actually um, promotes, um, uh, th this actually somehow um, expedites uh, things. So th that's my understanding of your question, but I do know it's a complex one. So. There are too many questions. Uh, to be honest, uh, I uh, hope I will be answering them all. So, for starters, uh, uh, opinion uh, poll role and government's role vis-à-vis -vis opinion polls uh, is uh, a significant one. It doesn't. Uh, it is not limited to establishing research centers to uh, provide uh, scientific research and uh, papers and uh, forms. Uh, the government's role is to take uh, all the outcomes and the findings and include them or act upon them when. Uh, uh, drafting their policy. 
policies and here I am not uh, I do not want to be pessimistic but rather realistic I do not believe that uh, GCC governments are acting upon the opinion poll uh, results uh, I hope I am not being cynical, but I hope that a government will start to take such opinion polls into consideration when drafting their policies and when, uh, and when making any political decision. Regarding um, uh, your question, Mr. Ahmed, there is uh, a, uh, a committee now that is uh, tasked with amending the surveys and questionnaires that distributed to the uh, public. So uh, questionnaires uh, have to go through uh, a social expert, uh, a sociologist, uh, before uh, being handed out to the uh, public in order to uh, extract uh, or to probe into specific uh, issues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, even when the questionnaires are well prepared and they are supervised by social experts, the answers that those questionnaires gather are not being analyzed through a, uh, a, a, a team that matches up to uh, the uh, team uh, competences that uh, to the competences of the team that prepares the questionnaire. Regarding uh, the challenges and the tools used by Sesri. Uh, in a Qatar University, in their opinion poll, there are several tools uh, such as the uh, paper questionnaires, but also the electronic questionnaires that are distributed by the broadcast uh, mail in Qatar University. Uh, some questions are sometimes uh, like uh, short and uh, quick, and uh, those are uh, the fastest to receive uh, answers. Uh, they are faster than uh, questionnaires uh, distributed uh, through emails and social uh, media. And they are also faster than paper uh, questionnaires. So uh, uh, this tool is the fastest uh, to uh, provide answers. Regarding the challenges uh, facing just any researcher and uh, not only opinion posters, um, Sometimes uh, you can see that uh, questionnaires uh, provide uh, different experimental uh, uh, answers that you will have to discard because you need to preserve the credibility of the survey. And if you open any hashtag, you uh, can see that the public insists on a certain issue. Uh, but uh, inside or deep inside, uh, they are not convinced. Uh, they are only following the trend, following the. And here uh, we should see whether or not uh, this uh, this uh, blind uh, following of this uh, trend will be reflected in the questionnaire uh, or uh, not. Thank you. Regarding the uh, cultural and uh, social uh, criteria, uh, I uh, went uh, through the uh, entrepreneurial framework uh, conditions, the EFCs, and uh, there are uh, 12 uh, EFCs, and they are governed by the people's perspective on entrepreneurship, and to which extent the uh, social and uh, cultural criteria allow for uh, new entrepreneurship projects that uh, can absorb more workforce into the market. There is a good uh, part of uh, data regarding uh, behaviors and uh, orientations of uh, entrepreneurship uh, their behaviors are affected by uh, and influenced by the uh, perception of the public uh, to uh, entrepreneurs but uh, this study is yet to be uh, completed, and in order to complete it, we need uh, to examine or to look further into the social and cultural uh, criteria. Uh, because uh, this session is about uh, uh, public policy making, I only uh, spoke about uh, EFCs uh, to the extent that they relate uh, to uh, entrepreneurship. We did, we, I didn't speak uh, in detail about uh, Qatar. Qatar is one of, uh, is uh, the only uh, country out of six GCC states that uh, 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 records uh, 
that has a, a close uh, percentage of women entrepreneurs and of uh, male entrepreneurs. Uh, the percentage uh, now is 51 percent, uh, I believe, and 49 uh, percent. And uh, uh, the uh, vision identified uh, the uh, three uh, objectives and one of uh, them is a human uh, development uh, because a human development will uh, will uh, help uh, generate uh, a good workforce competent uh, workforce uh, but uh, the study uh, is still looking into uh, whether the human development has uh, helped uh, produce competent workforce and this cannot be answered uh, unless we wait for uh, several uh, years to see whether vision uh, 2020 has uh, produced a uh, competent uh, workforce uh, in uh, the uh, public institutions or uh, the uh, private uh, sector. Thank you. So uh, we reach the end of this uh, session. I would like to uh, thank the three uh, speakers and uh, uh, this uh, distinguished uh, uh, group of uh, researchers who fought uh, the uh, plummeting energy after lunch to be with us in this session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.